whether he is covered with veneration or worship, he endures all of it and remains indifferent and detached. In the face of the profound dharma that his mind is unable to probe, he ignores doubt and hesitation. 4. Furthermore, the bodhisattva cultivates the four trances with exertion and special attention. He can dwell there, keep them and thus obtain the five superknowledges, the four boundless ones, the eight liberations, the spheres of mastery and the ten spheres of totality. Provided with these qualities, he obtains the four foundations of mindfulness and all the samadhis of the bodhisattva, such as the vision of the Buddhas, etc. 5. Finally the bodhisattva's exertion is without drawing back in seeking the dharma. He uses body and mind to pay homage to dharma teachers. He increases offerings, alms and gifts without fail or relapse. He dedicates his life to study and discussion of the dharma. During the first, second and last watch of the night, he contemplates, meditates, calculates and speculates. He looks for causes and conditions. He distinguishes between identity and difference. He seeks to understand the true nature and to establish for all dharmas their specific nature, their general nature, the general characteristic, the specific characteristic, the unique characteristic, the nature of existence, the nature of non-existence and the essential nature. The absence of decrease or of relapse of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas constitutes the exertion of the Bodhisattva. For all these reasons, he can produce and realize the many good dharmas and this is the virtue of exertion. For the meaning of the word virtue, see what has been said above. In addition, the exertion of the bodhisattva is the only one to be called virtue of exertion. The exertion of other people does not merit the name of virtue. Question. What is meant by perfection of exertion? Answer. When the bodhisattva, in his body of birth and his essential body, unites all the qualities, there is the perfection of the virtue of exertion. For the meaning of Paripuri, see what has been said above. In bodily and vocal exertion, the bodhisattva does not draw back. 4. Bodily and mental exertion. Question. Exertion is a mental event. Does the sutra speak of bodily exertion? Answer. Although exertion is a mental event, it is called bodily exertion when it makes use of physical strength. It is like sensation. Although it is a mental event, it is called bodily sensation when it is associated with the first five consciousnesses, mental sensation when it is associated with the mental consciousness. It is the same for exertion. When one expends physical force either by giving with the hand or vocally reciting religious texts and preaching the Dharma, it is a question of bodily or vocal exertion. Moreover, exertion is bodily when it is practicing generosity or morality. It is mental when it is practicing patience, meditation, and wisdom. Moreover, exertion is bodily when it is practiced on outer things. It is mental when there is effort special to oneself. Finally, gross exertion is bodily. Subtle exertion is mental. Exertion that has merit in mind is bodily. Exertion that has wisdom in mind is mental. In the Bodhisattva, there is bodily exertion during the time from the first Sittopada until the attainment of Anuttpadakaksanti 4, until then, he has not yet given up his body of birth. Starting from the moment when, obtaining the Anuttpadakadharma, he rejects his body of flesh and attains the essential body up until the moment he becomes Buddha, it is a matter of mental exertion. When the Bodhisattva is in his first resolution, his qualities are not complete. He is then planting the causes and conditions of the threefold merit. When his generosity, morality and good intention have finally been rewarded, he uses the latter to give gifts to beings. But as beings are not satisfied, he cultivates merit on a grander scale and makes a resolution for great compassion. He says, Beings have insufficient wealth and many are bad. I am incapable of satisfying their desires with my small wealth. If their desires are not satisfied, they will not willingly accept my teaching. If they do not accept my teaching, they will not be liberated from birth, old age, sickness and death. 
therefore I will use great skillful means to load them with riches until they are satisfied. Then the Bodhisattva goes to the Great Sea to look for various treasures. He climbs mountains and faces dangers in the search for marvelous medicines. He penetrates into deep caves in search of various objects, stalactites or precious gems and he gives them to beings. Or else, he becomes the leader of a caravan and he daringly crosses mountain trails, facing robbers, lions, tigers, wolves, and madmen. In order to make gifts to beings, he carefully seeks the most precious materials, and he considers nothing too difficult. With medicinal herbs and magical spells, he can transform copper into gold. By means of these many transformations, he produces all kinds of precious substances. And when he is successful in fabricating things that are not native in the four directions, he gives them to beings. That is bodily exertion. But, when he has acquired the five super knowledges, he can transform himself and create exquisite tastes. Or else he goes to the heavens to gather the food that grows there spontaneously. That is mental exertion. When the Bodhisattva collects riches and gives them away, this is bodily exertion. When he uses his qualities of donor to reach Buddhahood, this is mental exertion. When the Bodhisattva of birth body practices the six virtues, this is bodily exertion. When he Bodhisattva of essential body practices the six virtues, this is mental energy. Note by Kumarajava. When one has not acquired the Dharma body, the mind follows the body. But when one has acquired the Dharmakaya, the mind does not follow the body and the body does not hinder the mind. Furthermore, not to spare one's life in order to realize the qualities is bodily energy. Never to relax in seeking dhyana and wisdom is mental exertion. Finally, bodily exertion consists of not drawing back in the difficult efforts that one undertakes. Nigradhamagajataka It is told that, in the kingdom of Polonai, the king Fan Mo Ta, while hunting in the jungle, saw two herds of deer. Each herd had its leader. The one had five hundred deer and his body was the color of the seven jewels. This was the Bodhisattva Sakyamuni. The other leader was Devdutta. The Bodhisattva, king of the deer, on seeing King Brahmadatta killing his herd, felt great compassion and went to Brahmadatta. The king's people drew their bows and let fly a rain of arrows. But Brahmadatta, seeing this deer approaching him, commanded his retinue to put away their bows and arrows so he could learn the motive for the deer's coming. Approaching the human king, the deer king knelt and said, Sire, it is for a useless motive, namely, the pleasures of an outing and diversion that our deer are suffering all the pains of death. If you wish, we will furnish you with food, we will establish a sequence and send you every day one.